Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Hill, the Chief Scientist at Geoscience Australia, and I welcome you to our Wednesday public seminar series for Wednesday, the 24th of November, 2021. Before we go any further, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which we meet today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating uh, in our seminar today. And I know that we spread across a large part of not only our nation, but also overseas. And I'd make everybody welcome to that. And particularly if you're a first time um, listener and viewer of our seminar series at Geoscience Australia. Our presenter today, very excited to um, say that we have Professor Graham Durant, from, who is the director of Questacon, which is Australia's National Science and Technology Centre. As well as being the director of Questacon, Graham is an honorary professor at the Australian National University Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. He trained as a geologist and learned to dive to undertake his PhD work on the Scottish continental shelf while also contributing to offshore geophysical surveys as part of a university departmental marine geology team. Prior to coming to Australia, Graham worked for 25 years at the Hunterian Museum in the University of Glasgow, where he looked after geology collections, lectured in marine geology, undertook research projects, and acted as a petrological consultant for the North Sea oil industry. With that, I now hand over to Professor Durant to amaze the audience with his presentation today. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Steve, and uh, good morning, everybody here in the room in Geoscience Australia and online. It's my pleasure to be able to speak to you today. 2021 has been a remarkable year for a number of things, but for armchair volcano watchers like myself, it's been a terrific year. Not only have we had the volcanoes that are currently erupting in the Canary Islands, but we've had eruptions in Japan and, of course, the big one that I'll be talking about this morning in Iceland. Now, when I was a student, um, I learned about volcanoes from textbooks. And in university, we moved on to having an old grainy film of a Hawaii eruption from the 1960s. And that's as exciting as volcanoes got. So we had the verbal accounts, the written accounts and grainy pictures. That has all changed. And we're now able to see volcanoes and experience volcanoes in many different ways. And also in real time through uh, access on the web. And that's why it's a great time for armchair volcano watching. And you can get up close and personal with many of the, the great eruptions. So I'm going to talk about the eruption that happened in Iceland this year. And it's Fagradalsfjall. And it has become the world's most photographed volcanic eruption. And through that, we can see great insights into the nature of the eruption process. Now, going back historically, I think this is probably one of the first photographs of a volcanic eruption in 1902. And dramatic as it is, uh, it really doesn't show the complexity of the eruptive cycle. So Tempest Anderson was a, a doctor from Yorkshire in England, and he developed an interest in volcanoes and traveled the world photographing the products of volcanic eruptions and where he was able to, to actually record these eruptions in progress. But of course, prior to the advent of photography, one had to rely on written accounts, oral accounts, or you know, in some cases, these amazing old woodcuts from the 16th century of a burning of fire and sulfur in Iceland. So people knew about volcanoes, but of course it was difficult to convey the action there. And even into the 19th century, one had to rely on the work of artists to convey the sense of eruptions. This is from a very famous book, and it's really the start of accuracy in recording volcanic process. And William Hamilton, who was in Sicily, 
employed artists and was very insistent on the accuracy of the work. But of course, it's a static image. Now, of course, we're in a, a different environment. And the eruption in Iceland was remarkable in a number of ways. One, because it happened close to a, a city, Reykjavik. It's about 40 kilometers away from Reykjavik. And it happened at a time when just about everybody has a mobile phone in their pocket or a smart camera, or of course, other technologies that enable you to look at the volcano. The Icelandic authorities, and bear in mind, this was during close down. Uh, so the international flights weren't happening for, for much of the eruption. They, they reckoned they had about 340,000 visitors to the site. And if you imagine that each of those visitors probably took about 100 digital images on average. You know, I think that's about 34 million images of the eruption. And uh, those images, of course, appear in all sorts of places nowadays and are accessible. And they're part of a, a resource that enables us to understand the nature of that eruption. And this was a frequent site to and from the volcano as people trekked up into the volcano. They arrived in large numbers. And it's also remarkable because it was a very safe volcanic eruption. So people were able to get up close and personal and take their own records, or if they were professional photographers, they were able to capture great images. And of course, now we have the advent of drones. Now, hopefully you can see the, the drone in the picture there, because that's gonna feature in our next little sequence.
So I'd like to say no drones were hurt during the making of those films, but of course that, that is not the case. Um, that was a compilation of some of the hundreds of hours of video on the internet. And, uh, you know, it's a wonderful resource and there's some really mesmeric film in there. And uh, I would urge you to, uh, to go seek it out. So in addition to all those wonderful images taken by hundreds of thousands of people, um, the webcams were put up within a couple of days of the eruption started. And for me, for nearly six months, this was my morning routine. You know, I'd get up, sitting down, having a cup of tea and something for breakfast, watching what was happening in the video. And it was fascinating to see every day how the activity changed. And in essence, it changed from fissure eruption to central vent. It went from you know, one vent to several vents to one big vent to steady lava flows to episodic lava flows. And that sequence plays out. And you see over the six months of the eruption, the amazing variety of volcanic product. So let's go back and just put it into context. So Iceland is, of course, an island in the North Atlantic, entirely, almost entirely made up of volcanic rock sitting on top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So you've got the combination of a mantle plume, which is why Iceland is above sea level, and processes on the ridge. But it's a place where you can actually go and try and understand what is happening on the ridge. So there it is, sitting on the ridge. And when you look at the volcanic systems in Iceland, you can see that the ridge, which is coming up from the Reykjanes Ridge down in the, the bottom left, is offset on echelon and moves across, splits, and then curves around and heads out to the, the north into the Arctic Ocean. And we're gonna be talking about one of the um, little segments down in the, the bottom left on the southwest of Iceland on the Reykjanes Peninsula. But Iceland is really interesting for volcanologists because you've got different styles of volcanoes. You've got the fissure eruptions, you've got the shield volcanoes, you've got the central volcanoes where there's differentiation and more silica rich products. And you've got the activity on land and underwater. And then of course, you've got the activity that was during the ice age. So you see a whole range of different products. So it's a fascinating place to go and visit as a volcanologist. Now it's also a great place um, for monitoring earthquake activity. The Iceland Meteorological Office monitors the, the earthquake activity. And this was this morning, so it's pretty quiet actually. Um, and what you're seeing there is the, the dots, the various uh, seismic events, broadly outlining the plate boundary between the North American and Eurasian plate. Now it's not always as quiet as this. So in 2014, this is a seismic event, a compilation over a number of days that shows what happens when volcanic systems erupt. So you've got this volcano tectonic event and each of these earthquakes uh, was a precursor to eruptive activity or during the eruptive activity. And Badabunga was a, a great fissure eruption, eruption of large amounts of very hot basaltic lava, but it's in the north of Iceland and not many people could get there and particularly not in winter months. So you know, the roads get closed, although you can fly over. So we don't have you know, large numbers of photographs of that particular eruption. Now in 2015, uh, there's a lot of excitement when this huge volcano tectonic event happened offshore and people were saying, oh, well, are we going to see another Suetse type eruption? But there's no manifestation of activity that was witnessed at the surface. So whatever was happening happened underwater on the ridge. But that changed this year. And between February and March this year, there were about 50,000 seismic events, small earthquakes uh, that were recorded. And it was focused around the Reykjanes Peninsula on land in Iceland. So people were getting excited. Something was building up and people were just prepared and ready. So when it did erupt on March the 19th, you know, people were there in numbers and uh, started to enjoy the show. And what a show it was, it, it was fantastic. And people were able to get very close to it. Now, 
I th I, I've only heard of one person who got hurt breaking an ankle walking to and from the volcano. So, you know, people respected the volcano. They got close, they fried their sausages on it, they took photographs of it, they did all the things that you'd expect adults to do. And they did it safely. And the Iceland authorities, you know, treat people as adults. And uh, although there were one or two things that they uh, thought were a little bit um, dangerous, most things happened safely. And the public got this unprecedented view up close and personal with the, the lava flows in its different forms. But it's characterized by pretty hot fluid lava coming out about 1200 degrees centigrade. So it was very hot and you couldn't spend too long too close to it. So they back off and uh, get their photographs and step back. So the eruption started um, with a series of small vents and they built up spatter cones. And of course, what happens is the, the magma sort of sticks and agglutinates on the side. And you get these very steep sided spatter cones with lava then flowing out into the, the valleys. And the topography of this area was that it was hills and valleys. So it wasn't as if it was building out onto a, a flat plain. So that is part of the story of the later evolution of the, the volcano. So these fluid basalt lavas uh, started coming out and there were blocky flows and ropey flows and all the traditional flows and, and some in between that probably don't have a name. And what you realize, you know, I mean, I learned that there were two types of lava flow, the blocky flows and uh, ropey flows. But of course, you know, the diversity is much, much greater than that. So people came and enjoyed the show and they kept coming and um, the show kept going and it, and it went for six months. And each of these people had their cameras, their mobile phones and some of their drones. And that record is there. Now it just needs someone to assimilate it. And, and that's the challenge now. So theoretically, you know, somebody could tell the story of this eruption if you can actually get all the images in the right order and the right date. So there's a, probably a PhD thesis work of uh, analysis to, to be done there. But nevertheless, we've got a, a really good idea of, of what sort of things happened and the you know, different characteristics of the eruption. And, you know, people were photographing this. And I don't know whether you've ever been to a, a live volcano. You don't know where to point your camera. There's so much going on that, you know, you're over here and then you're over here. And so the, the good photographers, you know, I think, you know, the experienced ones knew to keep the camera going, pointing at one place. And, and they recorded some great stuff. Others, less experienced, you know, do a a record of their visit to the volcano and it's jumping all over the place and zooming in and out of focus and uh, you can find those sort of things on the web as well but the art photographers the professional photographers and iceland is blessed by large numbers of professional photographers because it's a very photogenic place they've created some wonderful records of the eruption in the different phases so the original vents centralized a little bit the vents split this is a sorry a double vent um both the vents were independent clearly would have to be be joined so in the early period of march into april um this was the activity and then a new fissure opened up in in uh, april and this is it from the uh, coast guard plane looking down and that again demonstrated classic fissure activity. So the magma was moving laterally along a, a dike or a fissure and erupting at various places along there. So the early eruption was starting to fill in the topography. It erupted from the volcano and it erupted from fissures and the lava started flowing down into adjacent valleys there. So it started to fill in the landscape. Now, if we just look at the the geology map here. I just want to point out where um, Reykjavik is. You can see the area, the grey area up to the northeast and the yellow area down the bottom is where the volcanic system is or what was, I suppose. No, it still is. And it's about 40 kilometres away from Reykjavik. And the fissure trends towards the city. So people were getting a little bit nervous, um, you know, 
if this move, magma is moving laterally, as it did, it, um, you know, would it actually get towards Reykjavik, the city itself? Um, well, it hasn't on, on this particular eruption, but a lot of the, the gases, the sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide and CO2, of course, depending which way the wind was blowing, did uh, affect the city. And the volcanic eruption also was a threat to the town of Grindavik, which is on the coast in the south of Iceland. That sort of blue square is close, to, oh no, Grindavik's down to the southwest of that. And um, they were con concerned on two grounds. W would the lava flow cut off the road and the services, and would it actually get as far as Grindavik? So uh, it didn't, I can tell you, um, so it's a spoiler alert, so Grindavik is safe. Um, but let's see the eruption as it progresses. And it, the lavas started coming out voluminously. There's a, a lot of lava produced. It's very hot, very basaltic lava. But interestingly enough, the chemistry of the lava was changing. And whereas the Bar de Bunga eruption that I figured earlier from the north of Iceland was, the, the composition was fairly uniform. Here in the Fagradalsfjall eruption, there was changing chemistry and the incompatible trace element chemistry showed that a lot of the magma was coming straight up from the crust mantle boundary, coming up from about 17 kilometers below the surface. But there's also more differentiated magma. So there's a, a big story of the geochemistry still to come out of this and the analysis and the work is being done at the moment. But you can imagine being there and uh, I don't know how many of you have seen red stuff. You know, it, it is a wonderful experience. And I'd make sure it's on your bucket list if ever you get the chance to uh, either go to Hawaii or somewhere, somewhere where there's active volcanoes. It, it's a great experience. And um, Jerome Van Nguyen, however, was one of the uh, great photographers and he's got a great record of uh, the action. And you know, it just blew his mind being that close. And these are a couple of his images. And after experiencing it through his lens and in the flesh, he, he got his drone out and uh, you know, took some of these mesmeric images of the eruption. And others did the same. And uh, you know, it became a, a great place for drone pilots to test their skills. And uh, you know, some of them have, have created a unique perspective looking at a, a volcano and a volcanic eruption from a different viewpoint. And, uh, you know, I think that that's changed the way we look at volcanoes, at least, you know, certain types of volcanoes. And the images, you know, I hope you agree, are, are mesmeric. Anyway, back to the, the technical details. So various vents in March, April, and from around about mid-April, the activity centralised on one of the vents, event number five, which is in the middle of the, the image on screen. And that became the focal point of the eruption from there right through to the end on the 18th of September. So April came and you know, it's snowy in Iceland, of course, and people came in huge numbers. They laid out, the authorities laid out paths really well and kept everybody safe. And um, they, they got to see a great show and uh, they got to see it up close and personal. And uh, yeah, this was a, a remarkable opportunity for a lot of people. And had the international flights been running, you know, the numbers who would have traveled from Europe and North America to experience this and, and from elsewhere in the world you know, would have been probably uh, you know, in the millions you know, because uh, you don't get the chance to see these shows all that often. So the lavas flowed, they started, they were quite thick in the valley they filled in a lot of the landscape. And here we can see what the uh, situation was before the eruption. And then, you know, a month later, or just six weeks later, you know, the activity was starting to centralize on vent number five. And the original vents are there, the cones, but they've all, well, they've largely disappeared, not all disappeared, but uh, some of them have been inundated. And the hill that's on the right there of the old lava flow, which the last time this area erupted was about 6,000 years ago. So you've got a 6,000 year old volcanic 
landscape being inundated by the new lava. That hill on the right was subsequently inundated and that little call between the two hills in the middle was filled in subsequently. So as Vent 5 started to centralise, the activity changed. For a while it was very continuous high volumes of lava and then it suddenly changed into um, what, what here is described as a lava geyser. So it became episodic, erupted, paused, erupted, paused, about every seven or eight minutes. And the activity at this phase was more explosive. So we can see the fire fountain uh, got really quite high. And they, they recorded it in excess of 400 meters in one or two of the eruptions. So, you know, this fire fountain created a whole new opportunity for the photographers and for the public to view a different spectacle during this cycle of the eruptive activity. And this you know, was significant because it was visible from Reykjavik. So you know, this was a view of one of the big fire fountains from Reykjavik, 40 kilometers away. And um, it was, uh, you know, people knew it was happening. So during the effusive phases, when a lot of lava was coming out, it was cycling. And again, this is three images that show people watching the eruption building up and overflowing. And, and you know, th this is just one of the videos of many that are online. And you know, you, when you see the video rather than just the stills, you can realize just how dramatic it must have been to, to view this and just go back to the before, the during and the after. And uh, it really was a, a remarkable thing to witness. Now the lava was very hot, very fluid. When it went down the slopes, it flowed as a stream. And uh, you know, there were waterfalls and uh, a lot of uh, very fast moving lava that was flowing out and then opening out into the, the lower valleys. And at this stage, the lava started approaching the coast and it then made the authorities a little bit worried. So they started building some earth ramps to try and divert the flow. One of them worked. There's sort of down in the, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, they're starting to build some earth ramps that protected parts of the, the system and diverted the, the lava into other parts. They were worried that it would reach the road. And of course that road carried all the services, all the internet cabling and things. And uh, they wanted to try and protect that. But particularly they wanted to divert the lava away from flowing towards Grindavik. Nobody knew how long this would erupt for. And uh, so, you know, the, the authorities have taken relative precautions and diverted the flow into two places. So it kept going uh, through May into June, into July, and, you know, created more and more opportunities for um, photographers to record it. And then it was clear that rather than it being a fissure eruption, it's starting to build a lava shield. And a lot of lava flows then started to come out from the, what was vent five, and started to build up a low angled shield volcano, very fluid lava flowing in all directions. And once one direction is built up a bit, it sort of moves around and flows in a different direction, building up a, a cone. And it inundated the pre-existing landscape. And, you know, from an image like this or this, you can see that the lava shield is forming and building up. Now, when you look at typical Icelandic lava shields, they seem to be active over not just six months, but over years. So it may be that we're just in a hiatus of the eruption at the moment, and it may be that it will come back and build up uh, more and more activity. So just along in the, the next system, so it's the Surtse part of the system was active for uh, several years on and off. So it's possible that uh, Fagradal's Fjall has got a, a bit more up its sleeve. So here it is, you know, lots of flows going in all sorts of directions and, and just wonderful imagery of the formation of shield volcanoes. Nobody had seen this sort of activity 
uh, happening. And uh, it's remarkable how you can then start to understand how shield volcanoes form. And it flowed down into the valleys. And this is uh, Natagi, which is the valley that takes it down into towards the ocean. And at the break of slope, you know, the lava accelerated and create these wonderful um, turbulent waterfalls going through and you know people were able to uh, watch it and experience the, the flows and in the bottom of this image you've got one of the earth ramparts that they built and this is the extent of the the lava going down into that valley it was a huge volume uh, of lava in that valley and if there is further eruptions you know clearly the the, the rampart at the end is going to be under pressure one of the higher level ramparts was overwhelmed early on and it became clear that it couldn't do its job and the lava just built up and overflowed. So as we come into September, you know, the, the character changes a little bit, but it's still producing quite a lot of lava, very, very hot lava. You can see a fair bit of sulfur around and the sulfur dioxide is certainly very problematic for the visitors and they had to be very careful that they understood the wind direction and uh, the authorities were giving very good information that enabled visitors to understand which way to approach the volcano and where the good viewing points were on a particular days. And the volcano kept surprising people and new vents started forming at the base of the, the big vent and the big lava lake built up and this was boiling and the videos of this show each of those little hot plumes bubbling away and this lava lake that's sitting underneath the, the main vent. And from this lava lake flows with them going down further into the valley. And the flows had different characters. So some of them were not quite as hot. Some were a little bit blo you know, blocky lava, you'd have described it. But you know, again, produce wonderful uh, imagery and opportunities. This sequence that's taken from a video in the middle shows a, a tripod, which of course they, uh, the lava came down so quickly that uh, they couldn't get close to recover their tripod. And that was also a sacrifice to the, uh, the god of fire, uh, along with a few other bits of kit, I'm sure. So here is an example of lava flowing from a lava lake below the, uh, the volcano. And this formed quite a, you know, a, an extensive flow that cut across the, the ground, through the ground, through lava tubes, into the, uh, the edge, the break of slope, down towards Natagi. And this is pretty much the last activity. So on September the 16th, there was still a huge volume of lava coming out, but it ceased on September the 18th. So from March the 19th to September the 18th, it was almost continuous volcanic activity. And that nature of that activity changed. And that changed, of course, the landscape. So I showed originally the slide on the image on the left when the eruption started. But by the time the eruption finished, the area in orange on the right um, shows that a lot of the existing landscape was infilled, that a lot of the original hills had been overwhelmed by new lava, and this new part of Iceland was formed. There's an estimate that it's over 150 cubic, million cubic meters of lava. And that area you know, seems small at 4.8 kilometers, uh, square kilometers. But uh, nevertheless, you know, it, it was pretty dramatic. And you can see how it was approaching the, the road and the town of Grindavik is just, just off to the, the bottom left of the, the right-hand image there. So of course, you know, scientists were sampling various things from the outset and were able to uh, record the character and the changes and the flow rates. And a lot of this data is still to be uh, produced in the publications. There have been some initial evidence coming out. And as I mentioned previously, the trace element geochemistry is really fascinating because it's giving an insight into the, the deep process under the volcanic system. So it stopped, but you know, a few days ago, there's another little flurry of excitement further to the west of the eruptive site. You know, there's clearly another um, volcano tectonic event. And there's been some activity up near Hecla as well. And 
people get very excited and very twitchy when they see these little clusters of earthquake activity. Is it going to be another eruption? And you know, again, for, for the sad tragics like me who go onto the Iceland meteorological site every day and see what's going on there, um, you know, it, it's fascinating to watch and try and understand something more about the process of seafloor spreading, what is happening at the, the mid-ocean ridge system. So my final slide is one that I suppose is a little bit of a reminder that with digital imagery, you've got to be a little bit careful that what you're actually seeing is what you think you're seeing. Now, th this is clearly the eruption, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's a composite image that's put together uh, over a 19-hour period by stitching together 70 separate images. And on the internet, you can find fake images of volcanic eruptions. So, you know, one, one always just has to be a little bit careful about what you're, what, what you're seeing. Um, but generally, you know, th there's enough there from reliable sources to give you a great insight. Now, is the eruption finished? I don't think so, but um, time will tell. There's been some evidence of further uplift. So since this eruption finished on September the 19th, uh, there's been about two centimeters uplift broadly over the area. There've been little pulses of tectonic activity that probably to do with crustal adjustment. And you'd expect that other segments of the uh, the ridge, the mid-Atlantic ridge on Iceland will be active. And uh, there are one or two um, signs that one of the central volcanoes, Askia, has got some activity building up there. So it's interesting to watch. And you know, as an armchair volcano, I, I will be keeping my eye on what's going on there and enjoying the imagery as it, as it appears, both real time and, and later. Because uh, for me, you know, coming a long way as a a, a, from a geology student many years ago and some grainy images of volcanoes, I can now start to appreciate the, the grandeur and the, the activity of volcanic eruptions. So thank you very much for, for that. I'm, I'm finished now. I'm going to hand back to Steve, if I may, if you're, if you're still there. And um, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. And uh, hopefully, Steve, you can moderate that. Yes, thank you very much, Graham. That was fascinating, brilliant photography and videos. Lots of great, um, great comments in the uh, in the comment line. And I do encourage any members of the audience, if they've got any questions that they'd like to raise with Graham, to simply type them into the chat line um with the uh with your video presentation here and uh, we will look to take them but graham there's lots of amazing com you know lots of comments that really convey everyone's amazement about the quality of photos and images that that you quite rightly said has made it one of the most photographed uh volcano and volcanic eruptions in history uh, i've got a question to start things off um you talked about some of the precursors perhaps for future eruptions and next stage of eruptions were there, you know, in hindsight, can we see that there were precursors for this eruption? You know, tectonism, uplift, all of those sorts of things, Graham? Um, well, certainly from February this year, February 2021, yes, it was clear that something was happening. The number of earthquakes, the frequency of earthquakes, the intensity of earthquakes was building up. And I think I mentioned there's about 50,000 earthquakes recorded over a period of a month. So it's clear that something was happening in the crust and beneath the crust of Iceland. But there were previous um, pulses of activity elsewhere on the ridge offshore. Uh, the further you get away, the less monitoring there is, of course. But there's an intense period in 2015, it just off Iceland under, under water. And Badabunga in 2014 was further north. Further north again, the Krafla eruption in 1974 to 1977 was another great fissure eruption elsewhere on the ridge. So there have been examples of eruptions. And of course, different types of eruptive activity. You remember 2010, the um, Eyjafjörður uh, eruption that disrupted all the air traffic in Europe with the, the ash. Different style of eruptive activity from one of the, the central volcanoes. But nevertheless, you know, 
very explosive activity, a lot of fragments going up into the high into the atmosphere. So the Iceland is constantly active and it just, you know, the, 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 the can be decades or years and sometimes only months between flows. But I think something of this type, people think it's the harbinger of probably a 200 year cycle of seafloor spreading. So we won't know uh, until we see what happens. Yeah. And Graham, is your finger poised on the on the internet button to book tickets and, and get over there as soon as you can? Uh, yeah. I, I, I've had the pleasure of being in Iceland quite a few occasions. I worked in Scotland, of course, it's much easier to, to get to Iceland. And uh, I, I've been there and I've done some research work around the Surtse volcanic complex. So we were diving to collect samples from a, one of the events called Surtla. And um, you know, that was in the prehistory before I came here. Um, but uh, it's a fascinating place to visit. And yes, I would absolutely love to go back there. And we'll do as I can. Yeah, that'd be that'd be amazing, Graham. And, and hopefully you do. And if you do, it'd be great to see an update on what you saw firsthand when, when you do go back. So that'd be great. Lots of comments, not only about the photos and videos, but lots of people very excited about some of the volcanic processes that were seen. Some people got really excited about the idea of cooking. I think you started talking about sausages and people started to think about lunch, but people got very excited about some of the things that could be cooked on the volcanoes. Um, so you've certainly got everyone uh, going on this. No specific questions though. So what I might do is actually look to wrap it up then and and just say a big thanks, Graham. Thank you so much for generously sharing your knowledge, experience, and, and really what you've been able to pull together on this really exciting um, eruption. Oh, look, just as I said that, we've just had a question coming from um, Eamon, and he wants to know, has there been any update refinement to classification of volcanoes based upon these ob ob glorious observations, he calls them? Okay, well, thank you, Eamon, for that question. I, I think that's a work in progress. And, uh, you know, we constantly learn uh, more about volcanic processes. So, you know, people will be rewriting the textbooks, even as we speak, and updating, and certainly updating the imagery in those textbooks. So I think the fundamental classifications are still standard. But I think we can see there's more complexity in one eruptive episode than perhaps you would have expected particularly from the geological record, you know, going back and you look at a, you know, a volcanic complex from a couple of hundred million years ago and you see small bits of eruptions and you try and tell a whole story based on small outcrops. We can see it's much more complicated, the process than that. So I think it's telling us that when we look back in time at the geological record, you know, we have to stretch our imagination a bit further than perhaps we have been doing. Actually, great. That, thanks for that, Graham. We've got a couple of more questions that have come in. One asking, um, was LIDAR used to survey the eruptions? And if so, how does the LIDAR equipment react to volcanic ash and heat? Well, and they well, also it, said brilliant presentation too. So, yeah. it, it, it's a good question. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it probably is knowable. And <laughs> when I go away, I'll, I'll uh, do a bit of Googling around and see if I can find an answer to that. But um, I, I don't actually know what equipment they've been using. I expect that they probably don't have much of that equipment on hand, but I don't know that. I, I'm guessing that, of course, some of the LIDAR collection could be done in an airborne way. So um, that, that might help with being able to avoid perhaps some of the areas of really bad ash and heat, but yeah. Uh, another question, this one from Chris Yule wants, uh, firstly says, thank you, Graham, but why is there so much variation in eruption style um, in Iceland? Okay, well, two parts of the question. What, one to do with Fagradsfjall, uh, and that's to do with the rate of magma production, the composition of that magma, the volatile composition of that magma, the size of the vent, you know, whether the vent became blocked or was open. So all of those things would interplay to give the different styles of eruptive process. So there clearly were times when 
there was more explosive activity, more volatile activity. And some of the graphs I showed towards the end do show a, a buildup in volatiles at a certain stage of the eruptive cycle. More generally in Iceland, great diversity of volcanoes because you've got the underwater on land under ice, you've got the fissure eruptions, the central volcanoes, the shield volcanoes. So the central volcanoes erupting under ice produce very different product from that erupting on land. So you find the same with shield volcanoes. So whereas you know a shield volcano on land, you've got the ability for lava to flow quickly down slope. Um, under ice, of course, it's constrained. So you end up building these table mountains with pillow lava caps. So same process going on in the mantle, but of course the external manifestation of that is very different because of the constraining effect of ice. And again, if you go underwater deeper than say 100 meters, you get a very different style of eruptive activity. Lava can't flow laterally. So you get buildup of pillow lava mounds, these elongate mounds that we, we see elsewhere on the mid-ocean ridge. Great. A really good question from uh, David Cannell here. Um, have there been similar volcanoes here in Australia in the past um, that we might compare to this Icelandic eruption? And I think David also wants to know where he might be able to go in Australia to see perhaps some analogues of these uh, processes. Okay, well, th th there's no direct analogue, but there, there have been, I mean, over the years, a lot of the hundreds of millions of years, a lot of volcanic episodes in um, Australia or offshore Australia. So the, probably the, the latest was opening up of the, uh, along the Tasman Ridge, the Lord Howe Seamount chain that was active. And then there's a, a chain of active volcanoes that manifest itself in Queensland down to the south and towards the Bass Strait. And th these are interesting because they record the motion of the Australia plate over a mantle hotspot. So if, you, if, if the mantle hotspot is what you're looking for, there is an analogy there, but we don't have the, the rifting episode like the seafloor spreading that you're seeing in Iceland. So the extent of volcanism is, is much less. The crust is much thicker in uh, Australia, it's continental crust, whereas there's no continental crust underneath Iceland. As far as people are aware, there's some suggestion there's sort of remnants near rock or close by, but um, as far as people can tell, it's very much um, ocean basalt building up um, as the mantle plume produces a lot of, lot of lava. Yeah. Thanks, Graham. We've got a question from Mike Dower here. There are some people speculating on the internet that space weather, i.e. solar activity, uh, impacts eruption activity. Is there any formal research occurring in this area that you know of, Graham? Um, no, and I think that would be unlikely. The, the, there are suggestions that tidal activity can play a role. And, and if you do, you, know, you can imagine changes in pressure. If you've got a sensitive system, it can actually make a difference. But um, I think that's probably a long bow, at least as from my perspective of the way I think about it. Um, I think you know making that connection with solar activity is just a little bit too far of a stretch for me. Yeah, yeah. And lastly, um, a couple of questions on a similar theme, uh, particularly from Lucy Barnard, but also I noticed Alice asked a, a related question earlier, and I think that's about perhaps sharing some um, some kind of expression of what it really feels like to be at an active volcano. And Lucy's asking about, is there a smell from the lava? And Alice was asking about the sound and just how loud the actual sound might be if you were there in person. Yeah, okay, good, good question. So yes, there absolutely is a smell and, and, and there are different types of smell. And I, I've smelt it in Hawaii, of course, I'm not smelt it in Iceland, but, um, you, you, you get the sulfur dioxide, you know, which dries up your throat and you get the you know, bad egg smell of uh, hydrogen sulfide. So there's clearly, you know, if the wind's in the wrong direction, you, you, you're tasting it and smelling it. You, you get the, the sound is really interesting because when you just get the lava itself, it, it's a musical crackling because the crust of the lava is freezing breaking and, and you know it's a wonderful 
evocative sound. And, and I've heard this on Hawaii and the eruptions there. But where you've got an active vent or an active flow, then you know the, the sound is much more dynamic, dynamic, more explosive. And you know, you go to a vent and there's a constant roar of activity. And some of the videos online do capture live audio or live as was recorded. And uh, it's worth listening to and, and you get the sense of the, the noise. And then of course, you know, big explosive eruptions, the, the noise is enormous. And you know, some of the, uh, the Krakatoa type eruptions, you know, the, the noise is heard thousands of kilometers away. So, uh, you know, the, the big ones certainly a, a bit louder than anything you would have heard in Iceland. Yeah, they're great questions, aren't they, about how, you know, we're so visual in our, and the way we often talk about geology and earth processes that those other senses, it's, it's great to have people ask about them because I think it really puts people in the place. Yeah. The, the, the other smell I should have added, of course, as the lava encroaches on the old landscape, it burns the grass. So you actually get smoke and you, know, you get the smell of burning grass, of course. So all of this would mix together and uh, you know, create the atmosphere and then, it, it, you know, greatest show on earth. Yes, oh, that's terrific. It was great to see people warm up with questions. I, I've got one in the room here, Steve. Oh, it's... yeah, okay. Yeah, um, thanks for a great presentation, Graham. Um, David sort of touched on this already, but I'm just wondering, closer to home in the Asia-Pacific, um, where's the closest volcano that we can go to if we want to experience something like Iceland? Um, well, uh, the, the closest active volcanoes, if you go to Vanuatu, you can go to Tanna, and that's been continuously erupting since, well, at least 200 years, and Ambrim, and there are places like that. There's no direct analogue to Iceland where you're on a mid-ocean ridge system. So, you know, there's different styles of volcano. Uh, Hawaii, I would say, is probably, you know, when you've got an eruption from Kilauea coming out of the fissures, you're getting hot lava, you're getting the lava flows, the breakouts. So, you know, that, that's where I would sort of head, keep an eye on what's going on in the big island and uh, focus on that. But, and David did ask where to go in Australia. I think the, the most recent eruption around Mount Gambia was about 5,000 years ago. So, you know, volcanic eruptions have been witnessed by indigenous Australians. So, you know, and you wouldn't rule out another one at some point in the future but they will be very episodic. So I'd keep an eye on the bus straight if I were you and see what bubbles up now. Terrific. And Graham, some great comments in the, um, in the chat line, really thanking you for a fantastic presentation. Mike, Mike Dower um, has followed up actually with his question about space weather. And he says that he manages space weather observation network at um, the Bureau of Meteorology and gets this question all the time, but he thanks you for your answer there, Graham. So well done, Graham. Okay. And, and just just before you finish, I, yeah. I need to I need to thank the photographers, and uh, I've tried to acknowledge as many of them as I can in the presentation, but I'm conscious I've not fully acknowledged all of the images because some of them you can't actually work out who took them when. So um, you know. This presentation wouldn't have happened without their work, and uh, you know it's all out on the internet for people to explore. But uh, they're the real stars of the show, so it's that their imagery that uh, I'm just uh, you know riding on the back of. So, so thank you to them. Terrific. Thank you once again, Graham. That was a fantastic presentation, really well received. Thank you also for fantastic answers to those questions and and responding to some of the comments. Really great to have um, have you in our GA seminar series. Now, speaking of our series, I need to give a little plug for next week's seminar. Our next Wednesday seminar will be by Dr. Keith Serkham. And this has been an eagerly anticipated talk because it's actually been delayed twice um, for, for um, reasons that were somewhat out of Keith's control. And he's going to be talking about the Geoscience Australia Laboratory. Today's quality is tomorrow's reputation. And Keith is the Director of the Laboratories in Geoscience Australia's Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. And in this talk, he'll be explaining the core capabilities. I don't think that was a deliberate pun. 
um, quality management role and future directions of the laboratory. I know he's doing amazing things with mobile labs and so forth at the moment too, and, and the outreach, um, science outreach into regional areas that can follow from that will be really exciting. So that will be our final Wednesday seminar for the year. So that's next Wednesday. Um, please all come and join in. But thank you again, Graham. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks for the great comments that are still coming in about how great Graham's presentation was. Okay. See you later, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.